I'll be reading this morning from Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees and of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. All right. I love that passage. That passage by theologians is considered the first, the first uh, spoken gospel. The first time in which Jesus is mentioned. The first time in which God speaks hope into the broken world. Now you just know it as like the, the, the creation story, the Garden of Eden story gone wrong. Uh, but I want to stretch your imagination a bit today as we think more on this passage. This is actually the first Christmas illusion, or the first uh, mention of the Christmas story. And it happens all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Would you join me in, in prayer as we, as we begin? God, would you move in our hearts today? We are people who need hope. We are a people who are, um, are desperate for a thrill. We, we largely feel bored and hopeless. So it's appropriate that what we're studying over the next few weeks is a thrill of hope. Would you, would you, uh, would you enliven or excite our imaginations today as we think on this thing? We pray this in Christ's strong name. Amen. Kids, children who don't know they are naked, crack me up. I mean, they know they're naked, right? They know they're naked. The funny part is, they just don't really care. And, and they certainly don't care who sees them. Now, Lydia and I have five kids, as you know, and we have two older, and then we, uh, not necessarily in a mindful way, but we sort of took a break, and then we've got three younger kids. It almost looks like we have two two sets of, of children. So our older children um, speak of our younger children as the babies. Specifically, um, Nolan and, and uh, Emma have always been called the babies. They happen to be uh, almost 16 and 14 now, but still, when our two oldest are going somewhere, they might say, are the babies coming with us? And it, it sort of annoys our, our, our teenagers, uh, but they're still considered the babies. But, but there was a time when they were Babies. Uh, this is uh, Emma and Nolan. Believe it or not, that's a little, little uh, bare-chested Nolan. And um, they grew up almost like twins. They grew up pals. They grew up doing everything together. And just just a few nights ago, when we read this passage in which Adam and Eve for the first time realize that they're naked, Emma reminded me, reminded us. Nolan would have no part of it. He, he has no memory of this, no recollection of this. But Emma reminded us that when they were wee little, uh, to annoy their older siblings, if nothing else, 
they would, they would come out of the bathtub and they would run naked through the house and they would scream at the top of their lungs, naked monkeys on the loose. I think I got that right. I don't even know what that means. Uh, but I do remember these very white little children running naked and wet through the house on the weekday evenings back about a year ago. No, back about 12 <laughs> Back about 12 or so years ago. So Adam and Eve hide. They hide from, the God, from God, from their creator God. They hide because they are naked. Now everyone of us in this room, I, I, I suppose, um, except for perhaps the youngest, if there are any any, any very young children in this in this this space right now. Um, we long ago gave up any tendency to run through the living room uh, naked, and that's probably for the best. Um, this is not literally a sermon about nakedness, as I'm sure you know. Uh, but I am so intrigued by the dialogue between Adam and God in this passage that, that Lydia just read. Um, I won't project it again, but we'll, uh, let me just read it to you again. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife, that's Adam and Eve, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden, they hid behind the trees. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Again, the Lord God called to the man said to him, where are you? And Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And what, is it, what does God immediately say? He says to Adam, he actually asks him a question. He says, who told you that you were naked? And I want you to hear a deep, guttural sort of disappointment in the words of the Lord in that moment as he says, I told you I didn't want you to realize that Adam, who told you that you were naked? What if no one would have ever told us that we are naked? Who told you that you're naked? I think of my oldest, my oldest pet. She's a she's a very old um, Springer Spaniel. Springer Spaniel. Her name is Twix. What if my Springer Spaniel, like one day, I, I come home a little early from work, and, and she freaks out and she she runs behind the Christmas tree and she hides her naked, furry body because she's ashamed of the fact that she has no clothes on. I know that's silly. She's naked, and no one ever told little Twix that she's naked, she's okay with that. Now before I go on, let me just say, everybody's going to keep their clothes on today, that's not what we're talking about. But what if nakedness represents all the shame and all the brokenness of who I am as a man? And I believe it does in this passage. What if nakedness represents all of the past and all of the shame and all of the brokenness that you bring with you today. As Adam and Eve ushered in this new era, they sinned against God, they, uh, they attempted to win their, their independence, but, but instead of winning their independence, what they actually won was death. The the clock started ticking on their lives at that point. As Adam and Eve ushered in this new era of brokenness, every one of us in this room, we are now keenly aware of our brokenness. And so you're in the business, and I'm in the business of, of hiding my brokenness, my shame, hiding it so well that no one ever can see it. And if we're honest, that becomes tiring. 
it, it, it's a laborious task. I don't ever want you to see me at my worst. You always want me to see you in your best light. And what intrigues me about this passage is that God is super, super concerned about that. God is seriously disappointed that we, this morning, we are, we are naked and ashamed. God, God is so, so seriously concerned about that that he determined to do something about it long ago. He is so concerned, he is so disappointed and saddened by the fact that, that you are naked and ashamed that in Genesis 3, he already un unrolled, unveiled his plan to deal with it. What is your shame this morning? We're going to answer that in the quietness of our own hearts, not out loud. But what is your brokenness today? If you would, it, it would be good if you would just go through the task of, of thinking on that right now. Just for a moment. Just putting a, putting a bookmark in there. You, you know what it is. Perhaps it's something that was done to you. Perhaps done to you long ago. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't your doing. But it's your, it's your deepest source of shame. It's, it's the brokenness that, that sadly sometimes defines you. Perhaps it was something done to you. Perhaps it was something that, that you've done to another. And, and, and you carry, you carry shame, you carry boatloads of shame. You, you start to find yourself with that. You don't want others to know, but you certainly define yourself according to that. Whatever that, that one thing is, or maybe it's a list, maybe it's a long list, but whatever that thing is, that it's something that you work hardest and hiding from others. Like maybe, there are, maybe there's some other things that you try to hide to some degree, but that one thing that you work hardest at hiding from others, from us, from one another. I want you to hear God say to you today through, through scriptures. I want you to hear God say to you, who told you that you were naked? And I want you to know that God's heart for you is that you, you don't have to be ashamed of that any longer. So Jesus came to earth, this whole Christmas story, the reason we put up lights and the reason we sing these songs and the reason we, we, we uh, look at this picture of this helpless little Christ child wiggling in the manger, and the reason that we spend 24 days counting down to Christmas, the whole Christmas story, Jesus coming to earth, it's all on the basis of, of God's decision to once and for all stomp on your shame and replace it with hope. That is a Christian ethic, that is a Christian teaching, that is a, a basic tenet of the Christian faith, is that God made a way to stomp on, to destroy your shame, once and for all, and replace it with hope. And so today we're looking, for the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at, at this, but today we're going to get you know, the first, the first uh, event, God's first promise of hope. We're going to look at two more in the next, in the following weeks. So God told Satan, right there in the garden, God told Satan, the coming Messiah, the coming Christ child, the, the, the child that ultimately will be born through the seed of the woman, God tells Satan on that day, the coming Messiah will firmly place his heel on your head and dig in. 
dealing a death blow to Satan. That is what Christ has done for you. That is the Christmas story. Speaking directly to Satan, God said this about the coming Messiah, the, the Christ child. God says, the descendant of the woman will be your undoing, Satan. And at that point, the, the clock started ticking. The clock started ticking and, and sin and brokenness were put on notice. Jesus will be your undoing. Genesis 3. We, we, we've read it. I've, I've read it to you uh, a second time. And now third. God said to Satan, He, this coming Christ child, He will bruise your head. And you will bruise his heel. What's going on here? What, what, is, what is he saying to this, this serpent, uh, this representation of Satan in the garden? Well, first of all, he's saying that, 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 that Jesus will, it'll be a headshot to you, Satan. In other words, a death blow, a, a bruise to the head is referencing, in Romans, it's called crushing the head of Satan, crushing the skull. Here, the verb in English is, is bruise, but it's talking about a death blow. Satan, you will be defeated. But what else is what else is God prophesying, referring to? Something that will happen several thousand years later. He says, "You will bruise his heel." What he's saying is, Satan, you you will you will deal Jesus a blow. Um, you will wound the Christ child, our Savior and King. Uh, you will you will deal him a blow, and you will wound him on the cross. But it will not be a death blow. It'll, it will merely be like a, a bruise on the heel because he will walk out of uh, the tomb one day. I mean, he has. He has walked out of the tomb. He defeated death. But, but God says, Satan, you will not be so fortunate. The, the blow that, that Jesus deals you, the, the wound that you will suffer will be a death blow. It will be a blow to the head. And that's the true meaning of Christmas. Jesus came to stomp on the head of Satan for your sake, for your good, to give you a future, to give you a hope. We're going to talk about some beautiful implications of that in a moment. If you have a pen, I want you to write this down or type it into your phone. I want you to read it later. Romans 16, verse 20. It's the passage that I described earlier. It's a reference to the Genesis passage. But in this passage, Romans 16, Paul uses the phrase, he says, crush the head or the skull. This is the final defeat of Satan. Two pastor theologians, they're both, they're both now deceased. Um, R.C. Sproul and Martin Luther. Both make reference to this Genesis 3 passage in which, uh, in which God says um, Jesus will, will bruise the head of Satan. And this Romans 16 passage in which Paul says that, that Jesus will crush the head of Satan. Both R.C. Sproul, theologian pastor, and Martin Luther, the great reformer, theologian pastor, both agree and both write regarding what they believe to be a fact that this final defeat of Satan is not only the defeat of Satan himself, but the defeating of all who oppose the Lord. Oh, you don't want to be on that side of the battle. This final defeat of Satan is a final defeat of Satan and his minions. Satan and his army, Satan, and all of us who for eternity push against and oppose and kick at the authority of God in our lives. The final defeat of Satan 
and, and this reversal of the universe, this, this reversal of the cosmos in which God returns all of creation to what he intended it to be from the beginning. And we all live for eternity with God. Jesus is our Lord. And we live in this, in, this, in this space and time where heaven and earth come together. And we live in this great day of, of industry and, and, and work. And, and, and yet there is no, there, is, there are no tears. There is no sickness. No one will die again. And we won't be bored at all. We will be thrilled all the time. We will be joyful all the time. We will return to what God originally intended for humanity. God says to you this morning, who told you that you're naked? Who told you that you ought to be ashamed? Who, who told you that you should go around covering your brokenness? That doesn't define you anymore, the Lord says. You're not defined by, by, by whatever your high school friends think of you. You're not defined by what your parents said about you. God says, who told you? He was wrong. She was wrong. Jesus came so you can be emotional unashamed. You can be transparent and not have to hide anything any longer. Like my, like my, like my kiddos, my once preschool kiddos were. When they used to run around with this freedom. When they used to run around with this light-heartedness light that, that every one of us wants. We wish we could go back. Oh, life's not like, oh, to be a kid again, but I just can't go back to that. It's why Jesus said to his, to his disciples and to his followers, unless you become like one of these children, you will never see the kingdom of God. Is he judging us because we're too mature to enter the kingdom of God? No, not at all. What he's saying is, in, in heaven, there's, there's a light part of this. In heaven, there, there's no shame. In, in heaven, there's an innocence. A regained innocence. And Jesus came, the Christmas story, so that your innocence might be restored. Hebrews chapter 2. We looked at Genesis, that's, that's the first book in the Bible, wrote many thousands of years ago. And then you trek forward several thousands of years, and we have the book of Hebrews, and, and look, it, it says the same thing. It says, because God's children are human beings, like we, we, have, we have skin on us, you know, um, we're flesh and blood. Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son, that's Jesus Christ, also became flesh and blood. Now, pause for a moment. Just a, a basic theological truth. Jesus, it says, took on flesh and blood, meaning he became a man. But Jesus did not give up any of his, of his, of his deity. He continued to be fully God. Because we are human beings, we're made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could he die. Meaning, like actually, you know, his heart stopped pumping blood, lungs stopped breathing air. Like that wasn't even, it wasn't even uh, a possibility unless he took on the burden that we have of being a human being. So God, the Son, said, I will do that. I will buffet myself, I will humble myself. I'm God, I don't have to, but I will take on this burden. I will do that, I will take on 
I will, I will, I will wrap on the, the garb, the clothing, figuratively speaking, that is a human being. I will do that for one and only purpose. For one and only purpose. So that he could then, so that his heel could be bruised, as, Jesus, as, as God said. So that he could die. You wonder, why did Jesus become a man? For one express purpose. So that he could die. That's it. I say that's it. I do believe there's a secondary reason. And that is, as Paul says, so that, so that he could be a sympathetic um, God. So that he could, he could understand. Um, he, he could anyway. But, but now we say, oh, he was a human being. He, he understands how I feel as a human being. He could before, but now we kind of get that because he wore this, this human garb. But the primary, the express reason that Jesus took on this human body, flesh and blood, so that he could know. Always been God's intention. The story, the Christmas story, the story of the life and times of Jesus, the gospel story, is not a story of love gone wrong or, or, or love gone bad or some sort of thwarted, uh, you know, God's, God's efforts were, were thwarted or, or cut short. No, this has always been God's plan. Or we should get through this passage. For, for, for only as a human being could Jesus die. <clears throat> and only by dying could he break the power of the devil. By the power of death. Only in this way could he set all uh, set free all who had lived their lives as slaves to the fear <clears throat> of dying. Amen. Okay, so what does this passage say? What it's really saying is the one thing that, that, that Satan really has uh, to hold over your head. And he's got a lot, right? But it's the one thing, the one thing that, that, that is the most powerful is death. Like that's the one key that, that he holds uh, against you, uh, that, 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 he, that he wags in front of your face, that, that the one most powerful tool Satan has is death. And so for Satan to be defeated, I know this is a crazy cosmic story. I tell my, my friends, uh, the, the people that I guide on the boat, I'll tell them the story about Jesus, and I'm like, I know, bro, I this is crazy. Like, I wouldn't believe this story either, except the Holy Spirit has moved in my heart, and he's given me faith, and I believe it with all my heart. It's a crazy cosmic story. I know it is. But, but here's how it goes. Satan, he has power over us, and it's the power of death. And it trumps all of his other secondary powers. And so the way that, that God was to deal a death blow to Satan was to beat him. That is that the best game Satan brings to the table. So what he says is, I will defeat his, his, his actual power over death. And that will be the end of Satan. And the way he does it is... Jesus takes on this human guard. He experiences this, this, this killing, this murder, dying on the cross. And then Satan's shaking in his boots. And then Jesus reanimates himself. He comes back to life. He defeats death. He overcomes Satan's most serious power. And that's it. Satan is defeated. And that's God's plan for you. Only in this way could Jesus set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. That's what Jesus did. He defeated Satan 
and he freed you. You're no longer a slave. You're no longer a slave to the ways of Satan. How many of us are still living, though, like we're slaves? How many of us are still living as though all the lies that Satan speaks into our, our, our heads are actually true? When they're not, they're lies, but we, we live as though they're true. So what I want to do is, for just a few minutes, I, 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 I have some handwritten notes. It's gonna, I want to share with you some beautifully practical implications of this truth. That God has defeated your shame. That God has, has defeated your brokenness and he has now replaced it with hope. I've got... Um, I've got a long list. I'm going to go through. I'm going to go through four or five of them. The beautiful practical implications of this truth. Number one, there is no more fear. There's no reason to fear. You you no longer need to fear Satan. You no longer need to fear death. Which, according to Hebrews, and which, according to uh, much of, of Paul's writing, death is, is like the, 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 the most serious fear that many of us have. God has defeated that. I read from 2 Timothy. Verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, and it says this. For God gave us not, gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. How many of you, don't raise your hands, but how many of you this morning really struggle with fear? Fear regarding your future, fear regarding your finances, fear regarding your relationships. Here's a big one. Fear regarding your eternal state, your eternal destiny. Why don't you know that Today is that is that is not from the Lord. God has defeated that. God is powerful over that. God specifically defeated death. I think all the time about how like I want to live my best life. I, I want to leave a legacy. I, I want to uh, invest in kid, my children so that they'll invest in my grandchildren. I, I want the best for River Church. And I, I want to be a good man. But I think all the time, but, but you know, looking back one day when I'm in eternity in heaven, this will just look like a snap of a Death doesn't define us. Fear does not define us. Bankruptcy, and I hope that never knocks on your door, but if, if it does, this 80, 90, 100 years is just a blip on the screen. God, God has come to defeat your fear in the most humble, true way. As a Christian, we're, we're really untouchable. The beautiful practical implications of this truth. Number two, there's no more hate. God has come to defeat, Christ came to defeat our hate, our, our animosity. I read from Matthew chapter 26.
Matthew 26, beginning with verse 52. This is the scene where one of the disciples had drawn a sword to actually fight on Jesus' behalf. And Jesus says this, put your sword back in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? We live in a day and an age where hate is embraced. And what what really concerns me is not how the world embraces hate, but what really concerns me is more and more how we, the church, we Christians, tolerate and at times embrace hate. And, and at times I think we do it based on a misunderstanding that, that God needs us to fight for him and God needs us to defend him and sometimes that just takes a wicked turn. The schemes of the devil cause it to take a wicked turn, to which we, we go from being defenders of the faith to being hateful people. And so that's why I take you to this passage where, where Peter himself said, I've got this. I will defend my Lord. And Jesus said, that's not how, that's not how spiritual battles work. I need no defense, Jesus says. I think it's good for us to hear that this morning and embrace that. Jesus would say to us, when it comes to flesh and blood warriors, I don't need that kind of defense. Jesus would say, if it takes that sort of defending, I could call on the Father and he would send legions of army angels and we would get this done. Jesus says to Peter that they let this play out. This is the will of the Father. Am I, am I, am I calling us to, to passivity as Christians? No, not at all. Am I calling us to be peacemakers? Yes. That is the truth throughout, throughout the scriptures. God came to defeat fear. Christ came to defeat hate. Number three, the third beautiful practical implication of this passage, of this truth, is that, that, that there's no longer slavery. That we are now brothers. There, we are now sisters. The, the song, I don't know if we've sung it yet. Uh, maybe we didn't. Anyway, we'll sing this before the, before the Christmas season is over. I'm sure we'll sing it several times. The, the, the wonderful, beautiful song, O Holy Night. And it has this, this line. I mean, this will preach. This, this, is, this is right out of scriptures. It says this. O holy night, one of the verses says, Chains shall he, Christ, Chains shall he break, For the slave is now our brother. Now, we live in an age of of actual slavery in the United States? No, it, globally it still exists. But, but, but what, what is true is that Christ came to defeat our caste system, uh, our, our, our system of, 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 uh, of judging one another and sizing one another up and deciding who is better than, than who else and deciding that I'm going to be, I'm going to hang around with people that are like me, and I'm not going to hang around people that are unlike me, and I'm going to hang around people that make me look good, and I'm not going to hang around people that might make me look weak or, or, or bad. And, 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 and the truth of the gospel is that Jesus came to defeat slavery. He came to defeat any sort of caste system. We're, out, we're all now 
brothers and sisters in Christ. And in the book of Romans and in the book of Hebrews, Christ is actually called, this is weird, our brother. And that we are adopted children of, of our Heavenly Father. He is our, our brother, our King, our Lord, our Savior, and our brother. The beautiful practical implications of this truth. Number one, Christ came to defeat our fear. There is no more fear. Number two, he came to defeat our hate. Number three, he came to defeat our slavery. Number four, he came to, to defeat our dishonesty. The beautiful practical implication of this hope that, that God pours into our hearts, speaks into our lives, and there's no more dishonesty. You know, several places in Scripture, especially in Proverbs, The writer says that the Lord God hates a dishonest scale. Now, what does that mean? We don't even use scales. Some of you don't even know what a scale is, perhaps. But, but it used to be like you would go, well, no, this is actually still true. I'm not making, I'm, 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 I sound like a, I sound older than I am. Uh, you, you, put, you put bananas on a scale, and then it says, right, so it's like two pounds of bananas, and then you own, um, you owe, like, oh, what's a pound of bananas cost today? 49 cents. Okay. We'll go with that. So, two pounds of bananas. Man, that's cheap. We should just have bananas for dinner tonight. Um, you know, yeah, buck for, uh, oh, that's a lot of bananas. Uh, but I could probably eat two pounds of bananas. Uh, so, so, but you know those, those, those little, those little, like, uh, maybe now, yeah, like a little picture where, like, maybe the grocer is, like, pushing the scale down further so that he's, he's being dishonest. Or maybe his scales aren't weighted correctly so that he makes more money. He's dishonest. He rips you off. You pay for two pounds of bananas, but you only get like one and a half pounds of bananas. Do you know that, that several places in the scripture, it says that the Lord hates them? We have, a, we, we have a misunderstanding, I believe, of what it means when, when it says that the Lord loves justice. We tend to think that, that when we read that the Lord loves justice, we, we, we tend, I think, to sometimes think that he loves, he loves uh, retribution, he loves incarceration, and he loves uh, to, to punish. If you read throughout Scripture God's heart for justice, what it is, God, God loves the picked upon. God loves the person who is taken advantage of. And, 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 God, and God defends the widow. And God cares for the orphan. And, and God, God's heart is for the people who cannot care for themselves. And this, this day of retribution, when, when Satan and his armies, when, when, when Jesus laid his heel into their head and dealt them a death blow, the death blow is also for all those who oppose the Lord. You do not want to be on the wrong side of that equation. God loves justice. God hates dishonest scales. The fourth thing, the fourth beautiful practical implication of this truth is, is that, that, that Jesus came to defeat dishonesty. <coughs> the last thing I'll give you today is this. Jesus came to defeat, to put an end to retribution. Paybacks. All the animosity, all the wrongs that you want to right, all the things that have been done against you and you want payback, you want a pound of flesh. God says that doesn't define you. Who told you that you're naked? Who told you that you're a man of retribution? That doesn't, that's not you. 
Whoever told you that, that you're a man of retribution, that you're a woman that's driven by paybacks, God says, that's not you. That's you no longer. You're going to enter the kingdom of heaven like a child. Lay all that aside. One last passage that I'll read to you today. Jesus came to defeat paybacks. There is no longer a need for your own personal retribution against others. The last passage I read today, Romans 12, it says this. Romans 12, 18 and following. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now, folks, let me just tell you something. If you're going to live peaceably with all, there's some noise coming into your ears and some, some, some information coming in through your eyeballs, getting to your brain, that you're going to have to turn off. You have to turn off that noise or you will never live peaceably with others. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. <clears throat> but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will pay, says the Lord. And then we might think, oh, that's because God loves to like really, really, really turn the screws tight. Like he's going to really get our, like, I hate this guy, but I'm going to let God zap him because God can zap him infinitely better than I can. Like, that's our motivation, but no, that's not it. To the contrary, it says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, it says, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will, it says, heap burning coals on his head, which really means you will create in him a sense of, um, of his own wrongdoing, and perhaps a sense of, of wanting to turn his own heart toward you as you turn your heart toward him. And then it says this, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Vengeance is not yours. Retribution is not yours. Payback that no longer defines you. Jesus came to defeat your fear, to deal a death blow to all the hate and animosity that, is, that has reigned in your heart in the past, to, to kill slavery, to, to, to put an end to dishonesty. And to say enough, enough with the retribution. Enough, enough with the payback. A new day, a new era has been ushered in. Now, we are to repay evil with good. When our enemy is thirsty, we are to give him nourishment. That's the meaning of Christmas, folks. No more shame. No more brokenness. God says, whoever told you that, they're wrong. That's not you anymore. You're clean, you're, you're innocent, you're childlike. You are a new creation in Christ. The old days, they've passed. The new day has come, and there is therefore now no condemnation. God doesn't condemn you. You're a new creation in Christ. Let's celebrate that this Christmas. Amen. Would you join me in prayer?